Nimesh Data from the University of Warwick. Right. <coughs> uh, thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Thanks to everyone for coming. Right, so I'm going to talk about a couple of things, multiple parameters, so they've already been motivated to some extent by Ulrich, and the next part which may seem completely detached about fault tolerance sensing has actually already been introduced as well by Xin to some extent, <coughs> and hopefully the transition from one to the other will, will seem more natural than it appears on the title. Right, so this is uh, the work obviously has been done by various people in the group, it's not all my work, uh, just to laser one. Right, so I'll sort of talk about the work sort of the various people underlined. Right, so quantum sensing is, is very exciting, very promising, brilliant, wonderful. But if you think about what people have in their mind, their vision of quantum <coughs> sensing or imaging, think of things like this, right? it's going to cure all diseases and tell us what's inside our minds. But if you then look at the experiments, this is what they look like. Eh? So this is what the practice of quantum sensing is single phases, interferometers, magnetometers, and so on. Now, this is not by per se a problem. It's just that we have to find a way of bridging this gap. And this is where the multiple parameters come in. If you think of almost any application in the real world, or even in the, sort of the scientific world, I think, other than LIGO, they involve multiple parameters. And so the canonical one is imaging. Of course, we all understand that images have many pixels. If you think of spectroscopy, involves sensing many frequencies, magnetometry, accelerometry, force sensing, at least in 3D. <laughs> and then, of course, you can think in terms of these parameters varying in time. So you have a time series, a potential infinite number of parameters, and so on and so forth. Yeah. In this talk, I'll focus mostly on the optical photonic uh, imaging part, but I'll have a couple of slides on the magnetometry part, and then we can talk more about it if people are interested later on. Now, the issue with sensing parameters sort of sequentially, I mean, in principle, it's not a problem. In practice, of course, it's slow. In practice, of course, you will need probably multiple sensors for the multiple parameters, and then reconciliation is probably going to be an issue. And in my view, the most important one, which is going to sort of get in your way, is while you're sensing one of the parameters, the others are changing. And so by the time you've done one and gone to the other and back and forth, things have changed. And these in, in practice or in the mathematical sense take sort of various forms. Maybe there are multiple phases. Ulrich showed quite a few examples. There may be phases with losses, with dephasing, with T1 times, T2 times, if you're talking about spin systems, and many other examples. But there'll be sort of a whole class of problems which involve multiple parameters. Now the issue, of course, that comes to your mind, the zeroth order issue, well, if we know any quantum mechanics, we know that quantum mechanics tells you you can't measure multiple things simultaneously. So how does it work? So I'm going to show it through an example, and hopefully it will become clear what's going on. So this is sort of a quantum imaging example, as I called it, sort of a multi-mode interferometer with many phases. Ulrich showed similar things. You can also think of this as a distributed network if these are not next to each other, but far apart. But the mathematical principle stays the same. And a good image, let's say, I'm going to use the word imaging in this, con in this talk. A good image is one where sort of the total variance or the total error of estimating all these phases <coughs> is small. Huh? So the thing I'm trying to minimize is some sort of variance. And let me take sort of an unrealistic but, but not a continuous variable approach where I say, well, I have n photons, which is very unrealistic, but, but what an engineer would call a peak power constraint, not an average power constraint like a CV system. And I have D of these pixels, or D phases, so D plus one modes. And what's the best I can do? As I said, there's already, I mean, this is also sort of the genesis of some work we did and, and others Ulrich showed on, 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 on distributed sensing and so on. Eh? So if you sort of write out the problem mathematically, I'm not going to go into the details, but you'll typically have a quantum state of N photons in D modes. We all know how many there are. And you write out what the phase imprinted would be on the light going through the system. And you can use the standard machinery of kramer rao bounds and, and, and Fisher information that the Shin showed. And you can calculate the bounds and so on and so forth. And the one thing which I'm not going to actually talk about in much detail is that actually this is a multi-parameter bound. So now I'm putting a constraint not on a variance, but a covariance matrix because I have many things. This is now a matrix inequality. And as it turns out in this problem, the bound can, in fact, be saturated. Huh? So this non-commutativity, while it is an issue, can be circumvented. Huh? So what happens when I, when I sort of work all this out? Huh? And we worked this out quite a few years ago, now it's pretty old. 
what you find, so this is the total variance, the quantity I was having to sort of trying to minimize or have as small as possible. So smaller is better. So this is the classical sort of benchmark with coherent states. That's the average sort of mean for the number equal to n. This is noon states, I should say two mode noon states. So if I take my n photons and divide them into d separate experiments and I do the experiment. So I'm measuring quantum mechanically, but I'm measuring them separately. I get a certain scaling. And then I can do with the multi-parameter, sort of a multi-parameter optimized state as it were, this psi s, which looks like this multi-mode noon state, which actually performs much better than these two. And in fact, you can show, and we have shown analytically, that the, the improvement between these two is actually an order d. So it's the number of parameters that you have. So if you have a million pixels, in the variance, it's a million. So in the standard deviation, it's a thousand. So it's probably something worth thinking about. Eh? Of course, the problem is if you're talking about a million mode noon state, well, it's not going to happen, is it? So, so, so there's a problem. And that, I mean, and this is can, the canonical challenge with quantum sensing is that you have these examples which sort of lead, give you this fascinating vision. But then when it comes to happening, it, it doesn't happen because of practical reasons. Eh? So I'm not going to talk about Gaussian systems because the other two people talked about it quite a bit. But actually, you can show that this order D improvement does not happen with Gaussian systems. It's a constant improvement. And this has something to do with the difference between Gaussian and non-Gaussian systems in quantum information. So for people who are familiar with it, there is a fundamental difference between Gaussian and non-Gaussian systems in computing, cryptography, communication. In sensing, it didn't used to happen, because at the single parameter level, there is no difference. Turns out when you go to the multi-parameter problem, which is the full quantum mechanical version of the problem, there is a difference. And non-Gaussian systems are more powerful, but I'm not going to talk about that much more. Now, as I said, another canonical example of 3D sensing is, of course, magnetometry. So you can think, oh, well, I have a bunch of spins, NV centers. I don't know, too many people decide. So I'm just going to say very many people. And you say, well, I have a magnetic field, which is constant. So this is the simplest version of the problem. And I want to estimate bx, by, and bz. And so this is a very fairly standard problem. And you can cast a whole class, so the whole sets of other problems, accelerometry, force sensing, atom interferometer, gyroscopes, and so on and so forth that are in this class. Eh? So what happens? Again, something similar. Again, I'm going to go through this very quickly. The canonical strategy would be to sort of take your spins, maybe use a third of them or a third of the time. You measure Bx with some entangled state, GHZ type states for x, y, and z. There's obviously the canonical classical scheme where you just have a big ensemble and you use a fraction of the ensemble to measure x, a fraction to measure y, and a fraction to measure z. And then there is a quantum sort of multi-parameter scheme, which is what we are proposing or we proposed in this paper, where you sort of prepare a more elaborate quantum entangled state, and you sense all the three parameters simultaneously. And as you see, if you're doing sort of independent parameters separately, so this is the classical scheme, you get 1 over n. You go to the quantum scheme with sort of this scheme, you get a 1 over n squared, but you get a little bit extra on the top. But then when you go to the quantum enhanced sort of simultaneous estimation scheme, you keep the n squared, but you gain a little bit of n. So this is the order d improvement. Eh? As it happens in this case, the number of parameters is 3. So you only get, at, at best, a factor 3 improvement in the variance, root 3 in the standard deviation. I don't know how much it's worth. This is obviously all in the noiseless case. Once you get to the noisy case, I'm not entirely sure to what extent this is practically interesting. It maybe becomes more interesting once you start talking about time varying fields and so on and so forth. Now, as I said, I mean, in all these problems, in, 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 the, in, in the magnetometry case, in the optical case, it's the imperfections and losses and those things that will come in, right? So before we move on, so this is just to show the sort of, the, sort of a graphical depiction of what I just said. This was the 1 over n scaling. So this is, again, the variance. This is the number of spins in, in, in the sensor. This is the 1 over n scheme. And then there are various 1 over n squared schemes. And then the lowest one is the one we have, which is this um, uh, sorry, this green squares. The reason you can't see the green squares is we also have a measurement that attains the bound. So again, it's a multi-parameter bound, but it can be attained with, with a set of POVMs that, we had, that are there in the paper. They're reasonably reasonable measurements, sort of local spin measurements. And that can give you this improved limit that is sort of 9 over n squared. And so as I said, it's a factor of 3 improvement over doing it separately. One can think about whether that's worth the effort. Yeah? 
Now going to the experiments on the optical side, and from now on, so I'm going to focus, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. So there are various experiments on sort of estimating multiple phases in optical systems. I just picked the most recent one from Fabio Chirino's group in Rome, but there are various experiments in various places doing similar things. And they actually have shown in this paper from, from earlier this year, this quantum enhancement of, 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 of multi, they estimate two phases in a three mode interferometer. The issue, of course, is, and I'm sure people who, in, most people in the room are aware of, is that in all these optical system post-selection is what you have to use to talk about improvement. Yeah? So the question really, in some sense, is what can you talk about these things without post-selection, right? And, and the issue, of course, is sort of the more modes you have, the more photons you have, you need better efficiencies. To what extent can we increase the number of modes, the number of pixels, or whatever you want to call them, without post-selection? And of course, if you're not talking about imaging, you're talking about various modes. Actually, even if you're not talking about imaging, you're talking about various modes, and the modes mismatching, and so on. So these things have to keep improving as your experiments get bit bigger and bigger. Eh? So this is not a new problem. I mean, people have known this for decades. Eh? I mean, so I definitely didn't invent this. So, so we looked at this a while back. And so we go back to a single phase estimation problem. And this is sort of a template I think Ulrich showed a few times as well. And this is also sort of the template that actually was, was, was sort of, of the experiment that, again, Ulrich mentioned from, from Jeff Pride's group, where they did show a quantum enhancement with a two-photon experiment. But the question is, well, to what extent can you take that experiment and you scale it up? Huh? Because, I mean, doing it for one is good. It's important, but then you have to do for two and three and four and so on and so forth, right? And so we did this calculation a while back when I used to be a postdoc in Unwomtu's group, and you say, well, okay, I have n photons in two modes. They have some losses in the beginning. There's some loss in my transmissions associated with my sample phi, and then there's some loss in the detectors. And I assume perfect photon number resolving detectors preceded by some loss. So this is a very crude, but sort of reasonable model of, of these things. Eh? And what you find, and you say, well, okay, so what do eat the three etas, eta p, eta d, and eta have to be? so that my lossy scheme breaks even with the classical schema. So you're looking, so etas are between zero and one, so you're looking sort of for the space in this one by one by one cube where I have to be to sort of start talking about quantum enhancement. So if you're at the point one, 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 which is sort of this point here, then everything is perfect and you're obviously getting quantum enhancement and then as you go inside, you, you start losing the quantum advantage. Eh? And then you find as you sort of go through those numbers of photons, sort of the size of your interferometer or sensor as it were, the region sort of shrinks on two axes. So I'm sure you can't see it from far back, but this is the detector efficiency, this is the preparation efficiency, and this is the transmission efficiency. So as you have more and more photons, you can sort of sustain more and more losses in the sample, but you get more and more sensitive to the detector and the preparation efficiency. And typically in these kind of systems, the preparation is also done by sort of heralding on two mode squeeze states and so on. So that's actually, there's a hidden detector in there as well. So you can sort of, sort of reach the conclusion that detectors are very important. And this, again, people have realized for a while and so there have been sort of good detectors and so on and so forth for a long time. So, so, so the, sort of the direction is, is, is let's say, positive. Eh? The issue, of course, is this one, right? That they need to get better and better as your system gets bigger and bigger. And this is always a problem. Eh? If that's the case, then this is not going to be scalable, right? Now, you say, well, okay, I mean, we have noises, we have imperfections, what well, we do are a correction. This, again, is not a new idea. So, Preskill was talking about it about 20 years ago, right? sort of have it. And then, in the last sort of three, four years, people have started talking more seriously and more rigorously about error correction in sensing. And so, there have been a whole series of papers, uh, as many as I could fit. But they all have some assumptions. Eh? So, so some assume specific kinds of noise, others assume perfect error correction, others assume perfect ancilla. And the typical conclusion, sort of the upshot of all these things, so this is sort of the generic setup, I think Zichin was showing us a very similar picture, is that if your noise commutes with your signal, there's nothing you can do. Right? No matter how clever you are, you can't tell the signal apart from the noise, and it's gone. Right? There's nothing that can be done. Which is, well, the way it is. Eh? Nothing I can do. Nothing anyone can do. So what, what is the best hope, as it were, for, for quantum sensing as you go forward? Now, we know what happens in quantum computing, right? Because none of these problems, in some sense, are unique to, 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 to quantum sensing. Quantum computing has exactly like the same problems. Your components get noisy, destroys your computation. It has to get better and better as 
the computation gets bigger, so the standard strategy is you do error correction and then you do fault tolerance, right? Now the issue is if you assume perfect error correction, there is no need for fault tolerance. So this is something we learned the hard way when we submitted our paper and we got referee reports saying, well, why do you are doing error correct why are you doing fault tolerance? Because all the error correction has already been done. So, so this was a bit of a surprise for us. But the point is, if error correction is perfect, there is no need for fault tolerance. The whole reason you need fault tolerance is because your error correction itself introduces errors. Eh? And as I said, in quantum computing, people have known this for a very long time, and it's very well studied, and it's very well known. And, and you sort of see things like this, right, on the left-hand side. Sort of fault tolerant encodings and so on. The issue is, when you talk about sensing, you're talking about these kinds of things. Eh? And these two, as it turns out, Again, we learned the hard way are very different worlds. Eh? So maybe you should do a sort of poll amongst yourselves as to how many of you feel comfortable on both sides of the diagram. Eh? So this is what we are trying to sort of bridge, that at some point, if the quantum sensing agenda has to become real, this gap has to be bridged. Eh? So we sort of tried to do that as a first step. So what are we talking about? in terms of fault tolerance sensing. Well, what do we mean by fault tolerance sensing? The first thing is, is fun, although it sounds that I motivated it in terms of computing, it is fundamentally different from fault tolerant quantum computing. And the reason is the following. In computing, you know what gates you want. In sensing, you do not know what you are going to sense, right? That's the whole point. Now, if you don't know what gates are going to get implemented, there's a whole set of strategies and procedures in fault tolerant quantum computing that stop applying here, right? So that's the first point to realize. The second point, of course, is it's a different problem. So we have different metrics. We are not really talking about the correctness of a computation, but the precision of a sensing process. And so what we do, and I don't think this is by any means unique. Maybe people can do it in different ways. But we sort of separate out noise into two types. Eh? The first type is the noise in the signal, right? And now I'm going to talk about a single phase estimation. I'm not going to deal with multiple phases here. And let's say I'm talking about a single phase estimation using a qubit. And so this is the, the simplest example, Z rotation about a qubit. So there's going to be some noise in the signal. And then there's going to be some noise in what we call devices. And this is the preparation of the probe, the measurement of the probe, the preparation of the ancilla, the entangling of the ancilla, and all these things. Eh? Now, the, the devices are something under our control. Eh? So these are things you make in the lab. So there is some hope that you can improve those. The other thing. The noise in the signal is beyond your control, so you can't fix it. Eh? So the question is, can you make better devices that will help you sort of tackle more noise that is beyond your control? So that's broadly the philosophy we take. As I said, by no means unique. I'm sure maybe people can come up with other ways. But that's the way we do it. Eh? And as far as I know, nobody's really talked about fault-tolerant thresholds in the sen context of sensing before. So, so that's sort of what the, the view we took. Right? And then you talk about thresholds. You say, well, if my noise is below a certain number, then I can do whatever. Right? So that kind of statement. So to do that, so of course, you have to make it sort of as general as possible. So you say, well, look, I have local noise. So this is sort of the standard or the most common form of noise that is assumed, for instance, in quantum computing, that my noise is local. It's full ranks. So I'm not assuming perfect noise in, in any case. And this noise happens everywhere. Right? So every state, every preparation, every measurement, every ancilla can have that noise. The second thing, or the, another thing that you have to realize is now you can't really talk about bounds. Right? You have to talk about actual variances. Because the quantum bound, or the quantum kramer raw bound, is a quantity that is independent of the measurement. Right? It's maximized over all measurements. The effect noise has on your system will depend on the measurement, right? Because different measurements will get affected by noise in different ways. So you can't really talk in a meaningful way about bounds anymore. You have to talk about actual estimators. And this is something maybe a lot of people in the quantum information side don't think about too much. Because you calculate the bound, and you say, well, anything is going to be within this bound, which is fine as a first step. But once you get to this point, you have to start talking about actual estimators. Right? So these are the kinds of things we sort of talk about. So this sort of, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but so this is sort of the basic scheme, right? So I have a qubit in the plus state, goes through the, some sort of parameter, and gets x measured x. 
and I estimate a bit and I send it twice and I send a second bit and so on and so forth. And this is sort of the native scheme, no fault of tolerance anywhere, just noise everywhere. Then I can think of a protocol, sort of 1B as we call it, where we try to fix noise only in this signal. Huh? So, so now you realize we can't really do anything to the signal itself, right? Because it's meant to be beyond our control. But what you can do is you can sort of interleave your sensing steps with fault tolerance steps. That's perfectly allowed, right? So you can send your qubit, does its sensing, comes back, you do a bit of processing and you send it back, right? So that's this sort of the middle protocol. And then you can think of sort of two subcases, right? So one subcase would be where the noiseless devices, right? So all my devices are perfect, all my error correction is perfect. So this would be the case that sort of matches with a lot of the prior <coughs> work, which says, oh, my ancillary are perfect, and so on and so forth. And then there's the case where my devices are noisy. So this is now what's going to happen in practice. And then to fix that, you have to use fault tolerance everywhere. So I have this not sort of nomenclature of sort of the filled boxes are fault tolerant things, and the empty boxes are sort of left alone, as it were, right? So this is sort of the, the broadly the kind of setup we have. Now, there are other issues that arise. Huh? The first thing is, okay, so now you, if you want to talk about error correction, you have to talk about, well, an error correcting code, right? So that's the first thing you have to do. As it turns out, there are theorems, actually fairly recent ones, that say, well, if you're trying to estimate a phase phi, which is a real number, the most sort of commonly studied or used, but they're not used because they don't really exist, these things in practice, but the most commonly studied families of quantum codes are what are called stabilizer codes. And there's a property called transversality, which I'll not go into much detail, but basically the notion that you, you try your error correcting code, or you pick an error correcting code in such a way that you keep the noise as close to where it originated as possible. And you stop, try, and not let it run away, as it were, beyond your control. This is not the only notion. There are notions of sort of approximate error correction and so on and so forth, but that's not what I'm talking about here. So once you take that setup, you pick you say we want to be a stabilizer code, and you pick that we need transversality. Actually, it turns out that there is no family of codes that is transversal for a real number. Right? So this is something called the Clifford hierarchy. And basically, there's no code that is transversal for all levels of the Clifford hierarchy. So the way to do this, then, or a way to fix it, and we came about this in a very roundabout way, as I explained, is basically you have to digitize your phase. Right? And then you say, well, OK, my phase is going to be some string of bits. So I don't know, pi by 2, pi by 4, pi by 8, pi over 16. And your estimation procedure is now asking, well, how many bits of this can I estimate? Right? And the more bits I can estimate, the more precise my sensing is going to be. And this sort of, in a way, tries back to the old things about fault tolerance from like going back to von Neumann and so on, where fault tolerance in continuous systems is very, very hard. It's much more tractable. It's still hard, but tractable once you digitize your system. As it were. So once you do that, once you digitize your phase, your, 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 your gate or your phase as it were, looks like these rotations. And so every, there's these fractions of 2 pi, and every bit is either a 0 or a 1. So every rotation either happens or doesn't happen. And what you're trying to estimate is these string of bits. I'm not going to talk about why quantum computing things cannot be used, but the basic idea is that because phi is unknown, you don't know at every bit what B0 a priori could be 0 or 1, B1 can be 0 or 1, and so on, so you don't really know what phi is. Right? So as I said, you pick an estimator, and we pick some very old, simple estimator going back to Terry Rudolph and then Grover, and it's a bitwise estimator. You send it once, you measure x, and if it's between sort of, if the cos squared of your, or yeah, so if, if the Sorry, I got confused. Yes, yeah, so if the estimate is between pi over 2 and, sorry, 0 and pi over 2, you say it's on sort of 1 on this side. And if it's between sort of half and 1, it's on the other side. And you keep doing this. So, you, so this is sort of a very standard, very naive estimator. Right? And then you say, well, so this is without, without any fault tolerance. So this is the native protocol. If I have this kind of noise, every component has a probability p of failing. The probability that everything works fine, which is one minus the probability of at least one thing failing, right? If that is below a certain threshold, and this threshold is given by the estimator, then my protocol works, and I can estimate the phase, right? So I can do this for every bit, 
and I keep doing this for every bit and I see what is the largest bit that that works. So that would be sort of this kind of scheme. So that's sort of the definition of the threshold, as it were. I'm being quite sloppy for the more formal people, but in the paper you can see sort of a more, 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 more clear definition. And then you say, well, what happens when I start doing fault tolerance? And so I put sort of these fault tolerant boxes within my sensing steps. Then, of course, what I call my threshold equation now changes because now my px error and pz error are these various errors are replaced by the logical errors. This is sort of not particularly profound calculation, but quite a bit tedious. And you can work this out with these things. And the threshold gamma, again, sort of changes to gamma prime. But I'm going to skip that and not talk about it too much. So this is sort of the upshot of the result of the our work. So you have to take your signal. It's some bit string of phases. The noise is local. And the fault tolerant threshold now is basically saying, what is the noise I can sustain below which my estimator works? Right? As I said, this will be different for different estimators, right? And so here's sort of the result, right? So the blue line, oh sorry, the red line is without any fault tolerance. So this is the scheme as it is. And as you can see, as my so this is minus log p, yeah? so so it's minus log. So so p larger is better. So minus log smaller is better, right? So as I go for more and more bits my experiment gets harder and harder, right? So this is what I'm saying. My, my p gets smaller and smaller, right? So minus p gets bigger and bigger. Once I do a little bit of fault tolerance, and this is just between the signals, you see my, my, my sort of demand on my experiment drops. Not by much, but it drops, right? And that's in some sense the point, that it drops. Now there are some technical issues about transversality of the gates and so on and so forth. How much time do I have? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to skip the transversality part, but there are issues with how you apply the phase. So, so if you're talking about now encodings, you have to do your encoding in such a way, and this is again something that doesn't happen in computing, right? If you, if you take your probes and you encode it in some fancy way, it's not a priori true that the parameter that is going to be sensed is the one that you wanted to sense, right? Because if it's a different state, because encoding is taking your quantum state, transforming into some other quantum state, physically the thing it is sensitive to may change, right? So this introduces another level of subtlety in quantum sort of fault tolerance sensing. But again, that's not a problem. We can fix that, but I'm going to skip that part. So come to the sort of the final sort of part where you have fault tolerance everywhere. So in my, in my devices, which used to be noisy, but I have some, 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 some numbers. So this we just call P prime. So P prime is the noise in the devices. Your threshold equation now changes to something else. You get another term, and this term basically comes from the number of ways my devices can go wrong. And there are many ways, as you can see, that they can go wrong. And you see, well, what happens, right? So again, going, so now I'm not plotting minus log. I'm just plotting the probabilities directly, right? So the red line is without any fault tolerance, right? So that's, that's the thing. Then I had the scheme with fault tolerance just between the sensing steps, and that's the blue solid line, right? So things got a little bit better. And let's not worry about the actual magnitudes of the axis for a moment. Got a bit better. So that's the blue solid line. Then I had noisy devices. And that's the blue dash line, right? So things started going downhill again, right? And at some point, actually, if I have noisy devices, it's no use for me. At some point, I just go same as without fault tolerance. And then the green thing is noisy devices, noisy signal, but fault tolerance everywhere. And then there is this little bit of improvement. Again, don't focus on the magnitude, but the point that with fault tolerance, we can now do better than we used to be able to do without any fault tolerance in the noisy devices. Yeah? Now, as I said, what this gives is gives sort of a quantitative measure of how good the experiments have to be. Yeah? And once they are at that level, then they become scalable. Right? So this is, I think, a notion that didn't quite exist in the sensing world. It's sort of everybody knew that experiments have to get better. Right? That's universally known and understood and appreciated. The question is, how much better do they have to get? Right? And this is, I think, something that the quantum computing side has benefited from immensely, 
which the sensing side has historically lacked. So that's sort of the gap we are trying to fill. The other side, of course, is at this point, these things, as you can see, the numbers are very small. We are talking about probabilities of parts per million, probably not going to happen. But this is something that can be fixed. Eh? If you go back to the quantum computing world, there's been a huge amount of effort in improving fault tolerant thresholds. I would guess something similar ought to happen on the sensing side to bring these numbers up. Better choices of error correcting codes, better estimators, better properties of what we mean and so on and so forth. Of course, sensing will depend on problem to problem. So this is sort of my last slide. So as I said, I already talked about sort of this, this fault tolerance part. And I think that's important to make that earlier thing of real world applications sort of scalable as it were. because. We think of imaging and other things as something that we know in principle can be done, but the question is how big can we make this experiment? How many photons can we sort of have? How many phases can we sense? Post selection, how do we get rid of post selection? So in that, to do it in the photonic case, you have to sort of combine fault tolerance with photonic quantum computing type ideas, which is a whole new set of challenges. But I think again, that can be done. Eh? There are sort of challenges which I do, certainly don't know how to fix. And there's no point having very good detectors, for instance, if your coupling to detectors are not very good. Eh? So you can have a 99% efficient detector with 60% coupling, which basically means you have a 60% efficient detector. Eh? So these are the kinds of problems which I think even a fault tolerant approach can fix at some point, but that would take, I think, some effort on a wider step, on a wider front to, to get to a regime which sort of I talked about a little bit. Thank you. That was, that was cool, there's a lot in there. Um, yeah. uh, it, it seemed like a little bit like at the moment that you tried to discretize this signal and get these bits out, that you might be like moving towards a like process discrimination setting where you want to know the difference between two processes. Is it, should this bit be positive or negative? And yet I didn't see any machinery from that. Well, yes, at the bit level, all problems are of that form, right? Every bit can either be zero or one, right? So you can ask, you can say any information processing task is figuring out is my bit zero or one. So it's not unique yeah. to this problem. It's not even unique to quantum in any way, right? It's, a, it's the nature of choosing a, sort of having a binary representation of things. So I don't quite see what the... I guess it's unusual to see the two together, but it looks like this would be a route to it. Unusual to see which discrimination, uh, like process discrimination and sensing or parameter estimation, seem to fall into two disparate categories, and yet. Yeah, I would say that's that's a historical artificiality <sighs> that's been introduced because okay. of the way things have progressed. But a priori, there's no reason. As I said, all digital things in the end are figuring out: is my bit zero or is my bit one? Right. So we are going to have a quick break now to okay. continue the session at 11.35, but let's all thank Animash again. Thank you.